welcome everybody thank you for joining us uh today is the first in uh our new series of broker webinars so we've got 12 this year um and we've got a panel of six uh, specialist presenters who will all be talking about topics that the brokers have told us are relevant to them so today we start with mental health and then we'll move on to, to personal development uh, regulatory change sales skills social media and climate change as as is normal with these we we just ask everybody to to keep themselves on mute and their cameras off just to help with um with bandwidth issues as the screen says the the call is being recorded so there'll be a chance to play it back afterwards and um i'll be rapidly turning my camera off as well because i don't want to appear on a video for an hour so um but uh, i'm going to um we're going to introduce Claire, who some of you may have um, met before through ecclesiastical web, um, webinars. We we used we worked with Claire last year, and the reason we've chosen uh, mental health as the first one is that the broker survey that we did last year pointed out that 57% of brokers experienced a mental health issue in the previous 12 months in 2020. In 2021, that had gone up to 68%, with the leading mental health issues for brokers being stress anxiety and feeling overwhelmed and as we're in January new me new star all of those sorts of things rapidly become oh dear same me here we go again it's a big year ahead so without um, further ado Claire will tell us how we can um, how we can address that Good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Chris. And I will just say my name may be appearing on your screens as um, Scarlett rather than Claire. And that's down to a little bit of a technical issue <laughs> uh, with Teams this morning, um, but it is me. Um, so look, you know, as Chris was just saying, you know, it, it, we've, we've run a, a few um, webinars for um, ecclesiastical brokers over the last 12 months, and we, we're absolutely delighted to be um, to be doing that this year and actually to be launching that series um, this year with um, what I think is a really, really important topic at this point. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, through, gosh, two years now, you know, since early um, 2020, we've we've all been living through stressful times um, and so much uncertainty and change, so many different things going on. Um, and as as Chris has just said, the ecclesiastical broker um, research has really highlighted mental health as being an, an important key topic for brokers and and their staff. So um, it's great to be kicking off this series with this with this subject, and I hope that you'll um, you'll take a lot away from the session. Um, Nick, if you can move on the slides, please. So my contact details are, are on the slide there. You're very welcome to, um, to to have my details and and to get in touch. There are going to be a couple of opportunities for interaction during today's session, and I really well we really welcome um, that interaction and, and your contributions. Um, so there'll be a couple of points where I'll ask a question. Um, those questions are not. Uh, designed to be difficult or to be um, asking uh, anything kind of personal or difficult of you um, and what we'll ask you to do is when I ask those questions if you can just drop um, any thoughts that you have into the chat um, and I know that Chris is going to keep an eye on the chat and at the appropriate point he'll read out he'll read out some of those um, if there's anything that comes up for anybody that's on the sessions that you would like to speak with somebody about offline um, or you'd like to get in touch with us about how we might might be able to help you then my contact details are on the slide there and you, you're very welcome to get in contact with us. So let's look at the session objectives what we're going to be looking at specifically in today's session then. So we're going to help you to be able to spot the signs of stress in yourself um, and in your clients and your colleagues um, and to know what to do to manage that better. You know, we all experience stress um, from time to time, and it seems like it's been a pretty constant thing really over the last two years. So really important that we know how we can manage the negative impact of stress a little bit better. We're going to help you to identify 
the signs of burnout. Burnout is a really hot topic at the moment, and I'll be talking about that a little bit more a little bit later, and to help you to understand the relationship between burnout and mental health and well-being. And of course, prevention is always better than cure. So um, we're going to help you to start thinking about how you can burnout proof. I'm not sure if that's actually a word, but I'm using it as one. Burnout proof yourself um, and your team and your organisation. So uh, next slide, please, Nick. Um, so we all know what it's like to feel stressed. But it's not necessarily easy to pin down exactly what stress means. When we say things like, this is stressful or I'm stressed, we might be talking about situations or events that put pressure on us. For example, times when we have lots to do or lots to think about and we don't necessarily have much control over the outcome, over what happens. Or we might be talking about our reaction to being placed under pressure, the feelings that we get, the emotions that we experience when we have demands placed on us that perhaps we're finding difficult to cope with. There's no medical definition for stress and healthcare professionals will often disagree over whether stress is the cause of problems or the result of them. And that can make it difficult for us to work out um, what's causing those feelings of stress and, and also how to deal with them. But whatever your personal definition of stress is, it's likely that you can learn to manage stress better by managing those external pressures so first of all, identifying what they are and then thinking about how you can manage those differently, perhaps, so that stressful situations don't seem to kind of pile up um, and get on top of us quite so often. And then also by thinking about how we can develop our emotional resilience. You know, I talk a lot in the work that we do. I talk a lot about emotional resilience and it's really key really fundamental to good mental health and well-being so developing emotional resilience is really key at helping us to manage difficult situations when they when they do happen and so that we don't feel quite so stressed when we do have those challenging um, experiences that we will all encounter from time to time so this is the first point at which I'm going to put a question to you. So um, again, what I'd really like you to do is to put put your question, your response to the question into the chat box. And let's just get a little bit of a feel. Um, if you can just go back a couple of slide, a couple of slides, please, Nick. We're a bit far ahead there. Um, thank you. So what I'd love you to do is, is just put your um, thoughts into the chat box, please. So the, my question to you is stress a mental health problem? So do you think that stress is a mental health problem? And let's see what you think. There's always a little bit of a lag of a few seconds while people ponder and put their thoughts in the chat box. So do you think that stress is a mental health problem? Let's see what you think. So I don't think you can see the responses, Claire, can you? So, no, no. Uh, so, so we're getting a lot of yeses. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, um, yes, stress is a mental health pandemic. Um, a few other, a few other yeses. Um, yes, but can have physical impacts as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any no's coming in, Chris? There is, there is, there is a no. Yeah. Yeah, there is one no. Um, yeah. There's also, um, yes, it's increasing year on year alongside anxiety and depression. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, some mixed thoughts there and, and that's normal, you know, that's to be expected. We all have our different perspective on anything really relating to mental health and well-being because we'll all have our different lived experience we may or may not have our 
um, direct lived experience of any of these subjects that we're talking about, or we may have um, had friends or colleagues that um, have experienced some of these things. But when we're talking about stress, you know, being under some degree of stress, feeling some degree of pressure is a normal part of life. It helps us to take action. It helps us to feel energized and get results. It prevents inertia. Um, you know, for most of us, if we didn't have any pressure at all, we probably wouldn't achieve very much except perhaps watch an awful lot of Netflix. So, you know, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of stress is is healthy for most of us. It's a good thing, keeps us moving, keeps us motivated. But if we often become overwhelmed by stress, then those feelings could start to become a problem for us. So let's just look at the next slide, um, which is that's the definition from the Mental Health Foundation. So that's the way they define stress. So stress is the feeling of being overwhelmed or unable to cope with mental or emotional pressure. So my question a second ago was quite quite a, a clear question, is, is stress a mental health problem? Stress isn't a psychiatric diagnosis. So in the strictest sense, stress isn't a mental health problem, but it is really closely linked to our mental health in really in two really important ways. So firstly, stress can cause mental health problems and it can make existing mental problem mental health problems worse. And as somebody in the comments said, you know, we're experiencing a mental health pandemic. We are, you know, before the coronavirus pandemic, mental illness, mental ill health was considered to be one of the biggest public health concerns of our time. And that hasn't gone away. You know, the, the ecclesiastical re broker research clearly shows that for those working within the broken community, that mental health problems have increased more people than ever before are experiencing um, symptoms of mental ill health or are being diagnosed with mental health conditions and are experiencing higher levels of stress than ever before. So I said that that stress is linked to mental health in two important ways. So firstly, stress can cause mental health problems such as anxiety, depression and other mental health conditions. Secondly, mental health problems can cause stress. So coping with the day-to-day -day symptoms of a mental health condition can be really stressful, you know, when you're trying to cope with that as well as potentially needing to manage medication or healthcare appointments or treatments and fulfil all of the other day-to-day -day responsibilities of your life, that can become really stressful and it can start to feel like a vicious circle and it can be hard to see where the stress ends and a mental health problem begins. So we all experience stress differently in different situations. Sometimes we might be able to tell immediately that we are feeling stressed and other times we might keep going without recognizing the signs. That really resonates for me. You know, my so my background is as an insurance broker. Um, I'm the one of the founders of Mental Health in Business and we set this business up um, almost four years ago now. But before that, I was an insurance broker for over 20 years. And actually I continued as an insurance broker for the first three years of of this business, mental health in business, and I ran them alongside each other. And, you know, that idea of um, not necessarily recognizing the signs of stress right away, that really resonates for me. You know, there have been many times during my my life and my working life, my career as an insurance broker, many times that I can look back now, particularly with the benefit of hindsight, and I can see that I wasn't acknowledging the negative 
impact of stress. You know, I was working under high levels of stress persistently for long periods of time. And I can see when as I look back that, you know, there were some really negative effects um, of that of, of those periods of stress, but I didn't necessarily acknowledge them at the time. And, you know, I, I, I suppose like a lot of people, I kind of wore stress like a badge of honor. You know, I thought that it went with the territory of being a business owner, b- being a business leader, that, you know, it, it it was just one of those things that, you know, we, um yeah, went with the territory. But actually, it's really important that we recognize the signs and that we're able to um, to notice if we are starting to feel the negative effects of stress because the consequences can be quite serious. Stress can affect us emotionally and physically and also it can affect us behaviorally, the way that we show up in our lives and in our working lives and our businesses. So I'm going to put another question to you now, um, and the question is on the next slide. So what are some of the signs of stress? So I'd really love to, again, hear from you in the chat box, and perhaps Chris can pick a few out as they come in. So what do you think are some of the signs of stress that you might notice in yourself or in your colleagues, your teammates, your friends your family members what are some of the signs of stress these started to come through very quickly um so we've got anger poor sleep or wanting to sleep too much insomnia lack of sleep again um a bit more anger actually um short temper heart racing uh, withdrawn headaches panic attacks, irritability, can't keep up with them, there's so many. Yeah, so isn't it... Feeling incapable. Gosh, yeah. Isn't it interesting that, you know, there are so many responses to that, Chris, and it, you know, that for me, it really shows that this is something that that does resonate with people, you know. We all... um, we all experience those feelings of stress from time to time and to different degrees. Um, and the impact, if we don't address it, you know, the impact of that actually can can be really quite serious. And there was a mix there, wasn't there, in some of those things that you read out, Chris. Some of those were, um, you know, really kind of physical um impacts and some of them were more sort of emotions and feelings and how you know how people are are feeling so let's have a look at at some of those so um i've broken this down into into three slides so how you might feel um so we'll have a look at those first and then we'll look at the behavioral impact and the physical impact and you're all going to know a lot of this but i think you know it's really important that we that we do look at this before we start looking forward and thinking about how we can manage all of these things um it's really important that we do we have this conversation and that you know we give some thought to the different ways that stress might be impacting on us and that we shine a light on that um and then that you know, it gives us a greater understanding of what the impact might be. And that gives us, you know, a, a, a platform really to then thinking of, thinking about how, how we can manage that better and how we can prevent some of those negative impacts. So let's have a look at some of these, um, how we might feel. So irritability, aggression, impatience, feeling wound up. Um, we might feel overburdened, might feel anxious, nervous or afraid, might feel like your thoughts are racing and you can't switch off. You might feel like you can't enjoy yourself or enjoy the things that you would normally enjoy doing. That can be quite a sign for some people, you know, if you find that you've lost interest or enjoyment in the things that you would normally enjoy. You might feel depressed, might feel uninterested in life might feel like you've lost your sense of humor there might be a sense of dread I'm sure all of us at some point have had that kind of Sunday evening feeling of dread you know you've had the weekend and 
you start thinking about the 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 week to come and you get that sense of dread around what is to come um you might be worried about your health i think that's been really common for people over the last year or two with everything that's been going on around us relating to coronavirus um i think those kind of health anxieties and worries have um have really increased for for lots of us um and for some people that you know that has really escalated into something a little bit more serious and then you might feel neglected or lonely or isolated and it's really important that we emphasize um that for some people who experience severe stress, that can lead to suicidal thoughts and feelings. And if that applies to anybody that's on the session or watching the recording of the session, then please please do talk to somebody about that. Um, you might contact somebody like the Samaritans um, or maybe speak with your own, your own GP or a friend or family member, but please, um, if that applies to you or if you're concerned about a friend or family member who um, you feel may be experiencing thoughts or feelings relating to suicide, um, please talk to somebody or if it's somebody that you're concerned about, then please encourage them to, to, to do the same. And as I've said, my contact details are on the slide and you are welcome to have those and to get in touch um, if there's anything that kind of really resonates for you in the session and you would like to um, to get in touch and speak with somebody about that. So let's move on to the next slide then, how we might behave. So what are the kind of behavioural signs or symptoms? If we could move on to the next slide, please, Nick. Um, some of the behavioural um, signs or symptoms that a person may be experiencing the negative impact of stress. I'm just waiting for the slide to catch up. Nick, if you can move on to the next slide, please. We might be having a little bit of a tech issue here. Nick, are you able to move on to the next slide, please? Sorry, we seem to be having a bit of a tech issue. I don't know if um, either the session has frozen or we're just having an issue with moving we, the slides on. They are moving in what I can see. What one are you after, Claire? Ah, right. So I'm still uh, the slide that I can see. So I don't know how this appears to um, delegates that are on the session. I'm still on how you might feel. Um. It's moved to how you might be physically, what's one on how you might behave. Is it the behave one that you want? Yeah, um, sorry, Chris, I think Nick may have just taken the slides down and started them up again. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, thanks we for did that. Get, uh, there was a lot of people in the chat agreeing with you about Sunday nights um, <laughs> as well. Sunday yeah. nights being the worst night and statistically, being proven to be the night people get the worst sleep as well so yeah um, and it it makes sense doesn't it you know we you know if you you're able to kind of switch off hopefully switch off at the weekend and and you know maybe just forget about the things that are, are causing those feelings of stress and then we get to Sunday night and you start thinking about gosh you know what's my week going to be like what have I got to face and deal with this week um, so it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that that's, you know, that's the, the day or the evening that people might have um, more of those thoughts. It really resonates for me. You know, I can think about the times that my stress levels have been the highest and certainly Sunday evenings were, um, you know, the point in the week that that would really impact me. OK, so back to the slides. Thanks for fixing that little glitch there. So how you might behave. So how the negative impact of stress may show up in your behaviour. And this, of course, applies to yourself. And also this, these are things to be watching out for in those around you, in your team members or your friends and colleagues. So you might find it hard to make decisions, may find that you're constantly worrying um, or, you know, worrying more um, than is normal. Uh, you might be avoiding situations that are, are troubling you, um, which kind of makes sense. Um, you might find that you're snapping at people more. 
that's definitely one of my signs for me. If I notice I'm more snappy than usual, that's definitely a sign that I'm feeling stressed. Um, people often bite their nails or pick at their skin. Now, both of those are forms of self-harming behaviour. Um, I, we're not going to go into any more detail around any other self-harming behaviours because I think, um, you know, it's really important that we keep these sessions as safe as possible. So we don't, um, you know, we don't need to talk about all of the other ways that self-harming behaviours that people may reach for. But it's really important to acknowledge that, um, you know, there is a whole array of self-harming behaviours that people may reach for at times of acute stress. And biting nails and picking at skin can be can be regarded as self-harming behaviours. So the next one, inability to concentrate um, or focus on the, the task at hand, eating too much or eating too little. And of course, that can show up um, in, in, in others. You may notice that um, changing in eating habits, but you may also notice weight gain or weight loss sometimes in people. Um, you may find that you are smoking or drinking alcohol or um, using other um, substances more than is usual. Um, and that, you know, we may notice in the way that somebody's showing up um, at work, even if they're not necessarily um, imbibing uh, during the working hours. And then feeling restless or like you can't sit still. So even when you can switch off, when it's the end of the day or it's the weekend, there, there may be this kind of internal feeling of restlessness and so you can't really switch off. And then the last one there is, is be, being tearful or crying. Um, and again, that's one that one certainly resonates for me there too. So let's move on to the last one then. So how we might be physically affected. Um, so shallow breathing or hyperventilating. Sometimes people will experience panic attacks and that sort of thing. Um, we may have muscle tension or pain in the body, unexplained pain in the body, blurred eyesight, sore eyes, problems getting to sleep, staying asleep or having nightmares. Um, sometimes people experience sexual problems, including loss of libido. They might feel tired all the time, but not necessarily be able to, to get much sleep or not sleep as, as well as you would like. You may find that you're grinding your teeth or clenching your jaw um, and you might have lots of pain or sort of tension in the jaw. Headaches, chest pains, high blood pressure, indigestion, heartburn, other gastro intestinal problems so gosh you know that is quite a list isn't it um, and then the last one there is feeling sick dizzy or fainting it, it's quite a list and you know it, before we start looking forward and looking at actually how can we manage all these things better um, it's important that we look at these it's important that we understand how stress might be affecting us we may have had these sort of things going on we may not have made the link between stress and some of these physical um, impacts some of these physical um, health issues that we may have going on really important that if anybody on the session today is experiencing particularly any of these physical impacts, it's really important that you are checked out by a GP. You know, some of these are pretty serious, headaches, chest pains, high blood pressure. You know, high blood pressure can lead to all sorts of physical health problems. And there is a lot of evidence to show that people working under high levels of stress persistently, that can lead to some quite serious physical health issues as well as mental health issues. So please, if anybody's on the session and you are experiencing any of those things, please go and be checked out by a GP or however else you access your health care. Please, please do that. So we've looked at some of the causes and some of the signs of stress and we've discuss that, that stress is not an illness in and of itself, but we do know that stress can lead us to becoming unwell. So for example, if stress lasts for a long time, it can lead to mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. Experiencing a very stressful or traumatic event, it, just even a single event, um, and that could be things like redundancy, it could be 
a relationship breakdown um, or a loss or bereavement, um, an acute um, event like that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. So, you know, there's a there's a big link between between stress and some potentially really serious mental health conditions. When we are trying to cope with stress and manage high levels of persistent stress, it can for some people lead to burnout. So before we start looking forward and thinking about how we can manage all of these things better, um, let's just quickly have a look at what we mean by burnout. And if we can open up the next slide now, please. So um, just back one slide, please, the burnout image. So for lots of us that are, are working from home during the pandemic, those blurred boundaries between home and work have made it harder for us to switch off and therefore perhaps for some of us more difficult for us to realise that we may be heading for burnout. And in fact there was a recent study by Monster that found that 69% of employees working from home or that have been working from home a lot of the time during the last two years are experiencing symptoms of burnout 69%. Um, and of course, the ecclesiastical um, broker research found really high levels of stress being reported. And it's unsurprising when we consider how many of us have been juggling over the last two years, all these different responsibilities, um, juggling busy work schedules, uh, trying to come, trying to um, you know, work out how to use all of these different platforms that we've had to use Teams and Zoom and all the others. Um, constant teams and video calls and um, some of us have been homeschooling and all of those different things it's been a really stressful time so many of us will know somebody um, either in the last two years or um, at some point that's had to take a break from work due to burnout but um, you know what is it what exactly is burnout um, what does the term burnout mean to you? Let's let's move on to the next slide and let's let's just open that up as a question um, to everybody that's on the session. So what does the term burnout mean to you when you hear that word or that term? What what comes to mind? What do you think about? What does it mean to you? We've got and mental exhaustion. Yeah. Exhausted incapable of functioning normally yeah reaching a breaking point and being unable to carry on can't do any more need a break exhausted is is reoccurring a few times feeling tired and sick yeah. all the time lack of energy to do the things you usually enjoy like running or socializing yeah reaching your limit and shutting down feeling helpless totally immobilized by being so overwhelmed yeah, great. Thank you for reading some of those out, Chris. So again, you know, it means different things to different people, but there's a, a there's a common lot of common threads there, aren't there? Um, the the idea of exhaustion and reaching our limit, and you know, a lot of us have been have been close to that at some point. So the term burnout was coined in the 1970s by the American psychologist Herbert Freudenberger, and he used it to describe the consequences of severe stress and high ideals in the helping profession. So first of all, when it was used in the 70s, it was used in connection with mainly doctors and nurses and other people working in helping professions who would often sacrifice their own well-being in order to help others. Nowadays, it's used more broadly um, and and it can affect anyone can affect anyone in any um, profession in any um, in any role um, there are different definitions if you look at um, you know how various professionals within uh, mental health and well-being and, and mental health services define burnout there are some different definitions uh, but 
all of the different definitions seem to share the idea that the symptoms of burnout are thought to be caused by work-related stress in the main and then potentially some other sources of stress. And that could include things like caring for a family member. So um, next slide, please. We're going to look at just quickly some of the main areas of symptoms that are considered to be signs of burnout. And then we're going to start to think about how can we look forward? How can we prevent all of this? You know, how can we improve our mental health and well-being and our resilience and make sure that we are as well equipped as possible to cope with future adversity? So there are three main areas of burnout and the first is exhaustion. So that came up over and over again in your comments. People who are affected by burnout feel drained and emotionally exhausted, unable to cope, tired, down, and they don't have enough energy to meet the daily demands of their life. They will almost certainly experience physical symptoms that include things like physical pain that doesn't necessarily have um, an obvious um, physiological cause and gastrointestinal problems um, and things like that that we've already talked about. So the second area of signs or symptoms is alienation from work-related activities. So people that have burnout find their jobs increasingly stressful and frustrating. They may start to feel quite cynical about the job that they do, the role that they fulfill within their organisation, their working conditions, the organisation itself, the purpose of their work they're doing. They may really become cynical about all of those things. And at the same time, they may start to distance themselves emotionally and start to feel quite numb about their work and everything that they do. So then the third area of signs or symptoms of burnout is, of course, reduced performance. And that's kind of obvious, really. Um, you know, when you think about those first two, you know, if you're experiencing some combination of those things, then, of course, of course, your performance is going to be affected. So burnout mainly affects those everyday tasks at work, at home, and when caring for family members. People with burnout are really negative about their tasks. They might find it hard to concentrate and they are going to feel quite listless and lacking in creativity too. So, so those are the kind of main um, areas of signs or symptoms of burnout that you might notice in someone. So we're going to start looking forward now, you know, hopefully, um, you know, that it's been helpful just to really put a spotlight on, you know, what do we mean by stress? What do we mean by burnout? What are some of the ways that these things can affect us? And now let's start um, looking forward and thinking about how can we improve our future well-being? How can we a burnout proof ourselves looking forward? If we can move on to the next slide now, please. So again, I'm going to put a question to you. Um, and I'd love just to see some thoughts or hear some thoughts um, from you before I then share some some ideas with you. So what do you think are some of the ways on an individual level? So thinking about you as an individual, what do you think are some of the ways that you can achieve a better work life balance um, or can manage your stress levels better um, so that you can have better well-being and avoid burnout. So what do you think are some of the ways that you can manage stress better, that you can protect your well-being and avoid burnout um, and have ment better mental health and well-being going forward? Let's see what you think. There's some, um, there's, there's quite a few. <laughs> and they it's a challenge keeping on top, isn't it, of them? Um, yeah. So we've got uh, we've got running, but I think that then turns into running away. So I think that. Um, but there's um, yoga, exercise, time with the family. Um, make time to to switch off a phone, and the PC, and put everything work related away. 
yeah. make more time for the family instead of working late. Uh, keeping a timetable. Be willing to accept help. Pet my pets. Open up to others. Speaking to someone if you're struggling. Recognising it. Taking time for you. It's okay to say no sometimes. Mm. Mm. Um, but I did miss some. Yeah, well, you know, look, there's some great comments there and you know for everybody that's shared something there thank you for doing that you know I think it's really good to hear from other from other people um you know what their experience is and some of the things that are helpful to them um because it gets us thinking a bit more so you know thank thanks for everybody that's shared something there um I've got a few thoughts um and it does it pick, picks out some of the um some of the comments that came in into the chat um and uh, hopefully there'll be some kind of golden threads here for you to to take away and just have a little think about if we can move on to the next slide then please so i've kind of split this into two two lists so things that are sort of personal things that you can do in your home life your life outside of work and then the things that you can do that are more work related although there is crossover of course and our lives are so interwoven aren't they um so let's look at the personal list first so good communication um you know it seems obvious but you know we don't all do it very well it's really important that we communicate with the people that we share our lives with about how we're feeling and you know if we are feeling really stressed out it's important that we communicate that with the people around us and also that we communicate with them about what support we might need um i think a lot of the times we um you know we don't do that and we expect people to mind read and actually most of us are not mind readers so communicating with those around us about how we're feeling and what we need is really really key um the next one um having a healthy work-life balance now that's really what this whole list is about but i've put it in the list for a really good reason i believe very strongly and this comes up a lot in the one-to-one -one coaching that i do with my clients if you you've got to go into everything that you do with the intention of having a healthy work-life balance because if you don't do that i guarantee you will not achieve that balance so you've really got to have that as an intention in everything that you do the next one really ties into that boundaries if we're going to have a better balance if we're going to create the time in our lives for the things that we need to do for ourselves. we've got to get good at communicating our boundaries and putting healthy boundaries in place and communicating with the people around us about those boundaries and then that will that will help us to um, find the time that we need for important things like self-care which is the next thing on the list um, I'm going to talk a little bit about self-care in a moment or two, so I won't I won't spend any time on it just now. But I'm going to come back to self-care because I think that we often misunderstand what we mean by self-care. So we'll come back to that. Um, support network. You know, we all need some people around us that can give us support um, as and when we need it. And you know, giving a bit of thought to that. You know, do you have do you have that in place? Who is your support network? Um, do you invest the time and energy that you need to in those relationships? I think that's important. Rest and reflection. I'm seeing a lot of people talking about rest at the moment. Really interesting. I'm seeing quite a lot of lifestyle coaches on social media talking about rest. Um, you know, there's lots of talk about all the, you know, the good stuff that we need to do health, um, health wise and exercise and, and all of those things. But time for rest you know, it's just as important as that. And are we getting the time that we need in this busy, busy time that we seem to be in? Are we actually getting that? Um, and, you know, can we can we make some little adjustments to 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 create that time for a bit of rest and reflection? Um, the next one, time out, time off. Um, there is nothing heroic about not taking annual leave. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm saying this as much to myself as to anyone else. You know, it, it's really important that we take time off, time to recharge, um, 
and you know time to just completely switch off from everything that's really really important um the next one exercise um and and then the next one healthy eating we all know that exercise and healthy eating are good for our physical health and well-being and they are also really good for our mental health as well um you know factoring in some time for exercise every day uh, can be a, a great distraction from the stuff that's bubbling away in our minds. Um, you know, getting out and focusing on something else other than the, the, you know, the big list of things to do can be really important. And also healthy eating. There's a really strong link between the microbiome in the gut and mental health um, and lots and lots of research around that. So, you know, having a little bit of a focus on um, on diet and nutrition, you know, can be really important for our mental health as well as our physical health. Um, hobbies and interests, that was something that came up quite a lot there in, in some of the comments in, in the chat box. Um, reducing screen time, you know, I think that's been a big one for me, um, you know, factoring in time away from our computers and away from devices, having, a, I, I have a curfew on screen time, um, in an evening because I found that if I don't then that really has a negative impact on my sleep and that in turn really has a negative impact on my mental health so just having to think about you know how much time are you spending staring at a screen and on devices and you know can you make any adjustments there that can be really helpful um, the next one access the EAP or whatever internal support is available within your organization. You know, most organizations now, even smaller organizations, do have some form of mental health support that is available. And that could be an employee assistance program, it could be um, private medical insurance via which you can access um, counseling or access to psychological therapies. There may be mental health first aiders, mental health champions within your organization. And if there aren't, then get them to come and talk to us and we can help with that. Um, but think, just find out what's available and make sure that you are accessing it if there is any, any, any support that's available. And then finally, um, you know, really importantly, of course, seek professional help if it's needed. You know, if you find that you are experiencing uh, the negative effects of stress if you find that you are experiencing symptoms of mental ill health then go and get checked out by a GP um, there and there are other ways of accessing professional support as well you don't necessarily have to go through your GP um, in 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 England we can also um, access uh, psychological therapies through the IAPT service um, IAPT, the IAPT service, which is improved access to psychological therapies. And you can refer yourself um, for psychological therapy through the NHS IAPT service, if that's something that you would like to do. So there are different ways now that we can access professional help. So let's just quickly look at the other list, um, the sort of work related. So if you open the first three up, you'll notice um, good communication, healthy work-life balance and boundaries, they're the same as on the personal list. And those things apply just as much in our working lives and our working environments as they do in our personal lives. You know, it's really important that, that at work within our businesses, we are creating the conditions for good communication, for people to talk about how they feel, what they need, the areas that they may need help and support and it's also important that we go into all that we do in our work in our work lives with that intention to have a healthy work life balance and and I'm going to emphasize this again in a moment or two those of us that are managers or leaders within our organizations we really need to model that behavior ourselves as well um, and you know one of the ways that we do that is through um having some good healthy boundaries in place so if you open up the next few um so time blocking working in short bursts factoring in pro proper breaks and break from screen time those are all kind of um i guess those are all about the way that we're working ways of working so you know for anybody that finds that time management is one of the things that 
creates stress for you if it feels like there's never enough time there's always too much to do um and and not enough time to to get everything done thinking about the way we work um and putting in place a, a little bit more structure in the way that we work can can be really helpful i find that time blocking is really really helpful and and i i really advocate that um and and that's something that um, I talk with the people that I work one to one with. Um, w- working in short bursts um, can be really helpful, and making sure that we are factoring in proper breaks and break f- breaks from screen time, particularly when we're working at home, because I think it can be easy to forget to do that. Um, so making sure that you actually factor that into your working day is really important. Um, checking in now you know I think that early on in the pandemic we were all really good at that um, and we were all um, you know checking in with our teammates and maybe we were doing uh, you know online social things with with our um, team members and it seems to me that that's slipped a bit for a lot of organizations or a lot of teams so you know are you checking in with your team are you checking in with each other um, as as much as as we were earlier in the pandemic, um, and 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 if not, is that something that you could maybe um, you could maybe rectify? Um, the next one, um, feedback, I think, is a really important form of self care uh, within within our working lives. I think that asking for, receiving, and offering feedback is um i think it's really important to to mo- to most of us so just have a think about is that something that you do as a practice or could you do that a little bit more frequently the next one encouraging open conversations as i've said already really important that we create the conditions within every workplace that it's just normal you know for us to have conversations about mental health and well-being um and then again you know at work make sure that you are accessing whatever support is available within your organization within your um your business your your team um and um if you're a team leader or a manager making sure that you're sharing that information uh with your teams and and making sure that they know what's available to them too so we have seen that there are lots of factors that can contribute to feelings of stress and that can potentially, (coughs) excuse me, that can potentially lead to burnout. By far, the most influential factor in burnout is the organisational culture in which a person works. Now, whatever our role in our organisation, whether we are a manager, a leader, um, a decision maker, or not, whatever our role in our organization, we can all play a part in contributing to the culture within our organization. We can all play a part in building an anti-burnout culture. So let's just have a quick look at some of the ways that we can do that. So by making this, the workplace psychologically safe, and there's lots of ways we, we can do that, um, but one of the most important ways that we can do that is creating the conditions for open and honest conversations. And we can lead the way at an individual level. We can lead the way by doing that ourselves, by modelling that, by you know speaking about how we feel and what we need. It's really important that we ensure that leaders understand the risks of stress and burnout. So it's important that leaders, managers within organisations are doing training around mental health and particularly around the risks of stress and burnout. We need to really be aware of how work is impacting on our well-being and on our teammates well-being so if we're a leader in an organization if we're a team leader um a people leader you know we really need to have an understanding as to how the work that we're doing um how workload is impacting on the the well-being of the people within our teams we've got a responsibility um as business leaders we've got a responsibility to ensure that work is not causing mental ill health you know we've got a legal duty to do that Um, and you know we all can play a part in in creating that culture of 
that anti-burnout culture, a culture of well-being, where well-being is really prioritised. It's really important that we always promote healthy work-life balance. So, you know, those of, those of us that are managers and leaders, we need to be promoting that in the way that we speak. And we also need to be modelling it by our own behaviours. Um, very often what happens is the people that seem to be the most capable end up being overloaded because they say yes to everything. Um, so, you know, again, how we can contribute to an anti-burnout culture is by making sure that those people that are seen to be the most capable, the yes people, don't get overloaded, that we don't, you know, keep piling on more and more to those people. And then lastly, just a little thing, but, you know, some organisations seem to have a culture of, you know, constantly having meetings and long meetings that go on and on. So, you know, let's let's have a culture of, um, you know, where we really think about, oh, is, is this necessary? You know, do we need to have a meeting about this or is there a, a different way that we can deal with this? And, and where, you know, when we do have meetings, we keep them short, we keep them to the point um, so that people have, you know, more time in their day to do the things that they need to get on and do. So one last thing that I want to quickly um, look at before we wrap up um, for the end of the session. Um, and, and that's just a little piece around self-care. So if we can just go to the next slide, please. So look, you know, when we talk about self-care, um, I am talking about self-care in its purest, simplest form. So whatever you need to do to give yourself the energy and the vitality to meet the daily demands of your life. Really simple. I think often it gets convoluted um, or conflated. And I think, you know, often we make it into something much bigger. Um, but it's not, you know, when we talk about self-care, we're talking about the really simple, fundamental things that we need to do day in, day out to give ourselves the energy that we need to meet the demands of our lives. So on the side, there's five sorry if you can hear some um, noise in the background there's a dog barking loudly in the background um so on the side there there's five self-care tips and i you know i really hope that um one of those at least is something that you can take away um and implement so the first one physical activity um getting out in the fresh air taking a break you know if you're working at home or if you're back in the office now um, taking a break, getting out for a walk at lunchtime, um, you know, is a great thing to just build into your working day. The second one, eating for wellness. I talked about a couple of slides ago about some of the, um, you know, the health benefits, the mental health benefits of thinking about diet and nutrition, just making a small change. And that could be um, drinking more water or introducing a daily probiotic uh, can can be really beneficial. Um, the third one, connection. You know, how can you connect with somebody today? Um, you know, I think a lot of us, we've lost a lot of opportunities for connection um, over the last two years. So having to think about how you can connect with somebody. Um, and then the second two, compassion and sleep. We've talked about um, sleep and the link between, you know, good sleep and mental health and well-being I think compassion is is a really important one for me you know I think all of us are typically kinder to other people than we are to ourselves so you know is there a way that you can be kinder to yourself today um, and a way that you could show a little bit of kindness um, to, to yourself and maybe somebody else too so that's it from me. Um, I'm at the end of kind of everything that I wanted to cover off in today's session and we're at the end of our time. So um, if there are any um, sort of last minute questions before we wrap up, I'm very happy to take them. Um, but otherwise, we will um, we will wrap up the session and thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.